Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Jill, and so glad you could drop in either here on Zoom or later practicing with us on the YouTube recording. And I recently went to a really good movie. I I loved it anyways. I know we all have different tastes in movies, but it was at like a review cinema. So I'm not sure how long it's been out. I should have looked that up. But um, yeah, it was called A Good Person, <laughs> which is an evocative title. What is a good person? Do we think of ourselves as being a good person? I'm a good person. I wouldn't do that, et cetera. Uh, anyways, it's um, starring Morgan Freeman and Florence Pugh, I think is how you say her name, P-U-G-H. I apologize, Florence, if I'm saying your name incorrectly. Um, oh, at, at one point in the movie, um, Morgan Freeman's character, I think it was called Daniel, and I cannot remember the context of the conversation and how the exact context of when it was said, but it just really struck me so much that in the middle of the movie, I pulled my phone out to write it down because I was like, oh, oh that's good. That's a good talk there. And I knew I, in the rest of the movie, I would forget it. So I was like, wrote it down quickly. And anyways, he, what he says is, comparison is the thief of joy. Comparison is the thief of joy. And uh, that really caught my ear, and I was like, oh, that's good. Um, and then a, a little Google search attributes that aphorism, that phrase, to um, Theodore Rose Rose Roosevelt, Roosevelt, um, Teddy Roosevelt, um, apparently says that he said that. Um, but also uh, they cite Mark Twain as saying uh, something similar that comparison is the death of joy, um, not just the thief of joy, but the death of joy. Uh, and of course, <laughs> most wise things have been said by the Buddha a couple thousand years ago. So check it out. And of course, we find the Buddha taught a about comparison and um, not that exact quote, but uh, so I'm going to share some thoughts about that. Uh, and so, yeah, to to give some reflection on where where do you find this coming up for you? I think we all have different kinds of comparing minds at different times. I think we can all relate to some degree if we look closely. Um, yeah, now what's interesting is notice where your mind goes when you think of comparing thoughts, because there's comparing thoughts that maybe the a common way that shows up is that others are better than me um, or other, not other people just, but other situations or other all the all the kinds of others so better than thoughts um or also we can have comparison that's worse than thoughts that like i'm not i'm I, this is not like so it can be in the negative um it can be that i'm i'm better or i'm worse and the other way comparing shots thoughts show up is it even with equal than thoughts, that's still a comparing mind when we're like, I'm equal to or um, anyone else. And uh, all of these are examples of comparing mind, not just one aspect of it. You know, so where does that show up for us? most strongly or at different times it may be in comparing our bodies to others or comparing our minds to others um it can be comparing 
homes or even you know gardens or something like I notice it even with my lawn and my front entrance to the house is like a little bit messy or you know stuff that hasn't been put away yet or tidied up or you know staged in a way like you know with whatever nice bouquets or something on the porch like and I I notice this in other people's homes and appreciate it like wow that's so beautiful as soon as you step onto the property you feel like you're stepping into this whole environment and so I I have a comparing mind with that when I come to my house I'm like <laughs> um it can show up in abilities like oh they they're so good at or or I'm so good at um, whatever the thing, whatever infinite number of things. We can have comparing mind with uh, friends or communities or education. I mean, I could, we could just go on and on. And uh, there, there's a, a sutta, one of the teachings of the Buddha that have been written down in in our um, texts that we study, and I'll just name the sutta for some people like to look these things up or reference them themselves. So this is in the what's called the Samyutta Nikaya 22, 22.49, 22.49. Um, and if you're watching here on the YouTube, um, I'll put that link down below, you can check it out. And the Buddha is teaching in this in this short sutta on um, referring to these three kinds of comparison, whether whether the thoughts are I am better or superior, better than you or superior to you, or equally, I am equal to you, or I am worse than you or in inferior to you. And the Buddha says, people that have either of these three comparing views are not seeing things as they really are. And one who does not have these views is seeing with wisdom and seeing the true nature of how things are. So the reason why this saying uh, that that comparison is the thief of joy or even the death of joy um, is because it robs, it steals, the thief of joy steals our own satisfaction, our own contentment, happiness, joy. Um, it also creates separation we feel isolated from others when we're comparing in any of those ways. Even when we're comparing with the equal to, we're still creating a self that's separate and that is judging and comparing. Um, it, and it can be, depending on how it's showing up, it can be either this sense of not enoughness, always feeling inadequate always feeling not good enough um or in the other side of the continuum it can be really fueling a lot of ego um, when we're in the state of feeling better than comparisons um and this also shows up in in our daily lives of course quite Quite frequently, I would, in this system, it shows up a lot, just constantly kind of noticing other people and comparing all the time. It just happens very subtly and quite consistently. But where it really shows up, as everything does, is on a meditation retreat. It can, because because we've stripped away a lot of the busyness and distraction. And this is where we come into these purification practices where we really get to see these habits of mind, these conditionings. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, it's not, yeah, 
it's very closely related to judging mind, comparing mind, judging. We're either judging ourselves or judging others. Was it my first retreat? Yeah, I think it was my very first retreat. <laughs> I, I mean, it's something that's come up many times, less so. No, still there, but less so, yes. And But first retreat, I was, I remember going to the teacher and I was just like so not too strong a word, but it's pretty close, disgusted with my mind. I was just like, what a cesspool, just constant judging, constant comparing. And it was so uncomfortable to just have to notice it. <laughs> constantly like how people were walking how they were breathing even if oh they're breathing too noisily or too they're controlling their breath or how people were sitting um how they line up for food what they eat how they eat it was just how they do walking meditation oh it's exhausting and and so highly unpleasant to have to notice this um and even if we're maybe maybe that's not your tendency to compare yourself to others it may be comparing yourself to some earlier version of yourself or some projected future imagined version of yourself i used to be able to do this and that i used to be whatever whatever I used to, yeah, all the things, <laughs> or I'm going to be, I want to be, and and so that's it. very similar to, and and it can go any of those ways, um, comparing through all those different versions of it. Um, in uh, Shinrin. Suzuki Roshi's um, book, Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, he refers to another sutta, um, which I, I uh, found um, called, uh, called the, it's in the Anguta Nikaya, for those that want to look that up, it's 4.1113, it's called the Patoda Sutta or uh, which is translated to mean the goad stick sutta. And uh, it, it, and uh, Suzuki Roshi talks about this. So I won't read the wording of the sutta because it's, it's um, just a little bit more cumbersome, or a little bit ar archaic, um, and harder to just get the the gist of it but if you want to look it up and and follow the sutta you can do that i'll put the link for it below um so this is um suzuki roshi's encapsulation of this sutta uh it is said that there are four kinds of horses excellent ones good ones poor ones and bad ones. The best horse will run slow and fast, right and left, at the driver's will before it even sees the shadow of the whip. The second best horse will run as well as the first one does just before the whip reaches its skin. So the first horse is anticipating and um, without even needing to see the whip, the second horse, um, yeah, whip is, is not a nice image. So the in the sutta, they call it a goad stick. So it's like a stick that prods, which is a little, I don't know, maybe it's just as nasty. But anyways, the second horse um, will uh, ride just as well um, just by seeing the stick. The third one will run when it feels the pain on its body. 
and the fourth will run after the pain penetrates to the marrow of its bones. And then uh, Suzuki says, Suzuki Roshi says, you can imagine how difficult it is for the fourth one to learn to run. He goes on to say, when we hear this story, almost all of us want to be the best horse. And if it's impossible for us to be the best one, we want to be the second best. <laughs> that is, I think, the usual understanding of this story and of Zen. You may think that when you sit in meditation, you will find out whether you are one of the best horses or one of the worst ones. Here, however, there is a misunderstanding of meditation. I'm changing the word Zen to meditation just to open it up to all kinds of meditation. If you think the aim of meditation practice is to train you to become one of the best horses, you will have a big problem. This is not the right understanding. If you practice in the right way, it does not matter whether you are the best horse or the worst one. When you consider the mercy, the compassion of the Buddha, how do you think the Buddha will feel about the four kinds of horses? He will have more sympathy for the worst one than for the best one. When you are determined to practice meditation with the great mind of Buddha, you will find the worst horse is the most valuable one. In your very imperfections, you will find basis for your firm, way-seeking mind. Those who can sit perfectly usually take more time to obtain the true way, the actual feeling and the marrow of meditation. But those who find great difficulties in practicing will find more meaning in it. So I think that sometimes the best horse may be the worst horse, and the worst horse can be the best one. This really um, also points towards the truth that uh, that's often said that dukkha is a gateway, so our difficulties are ways that prod us into awakening. If we just are sitting with absolute ease and some, well, I, you don't usually even see this, but like say somebody is trying to sit in full lotus and they're, which means a cross-legged position where the feet are right up onto the thighs, which is just, just don't, but <laughs> so bad for your knees. Uh uh, but say I have seen like I saw this maybe twice in all my years of meditation and they are, they're sitting very still and they may, maybe even have no pain and really calm clear mind and every time they meditate it's just easeful and still <laughs> there's not much fodder for insight there it's really it's really in the sitting with, being with the dukkha, the, in this case, the comparing mind, the judging mind, either of ourselves or others, that we can have the insights into how this is the death of joy, the thief of joy, and how we can cultivate kindness and wisdom and freedom from these painful states um yeah uh he he, he uh he adds the same type of notes but i'll just share his words um he, yeah he's talking about someone who's sitting in a perfect posture and um but even though you cannot take the right posture when you arouse your zeal your way seeking mind you can practice in its true sense actually it's easier for those having difficulties in sitting 
to arouse the true way-seeking mind than for those who can sit easily. He's just talking about posture there, but it, it also includes um, all, all the states of mind and body. Um, yeah, so our, our formal practice is, is uh, what's the word? It's, a, it's our, hmm, there's a word. It's our laboratory where we get to strip away some of the distractions and allow the mind states coming through, states of mind and heart to be known and to be met with skillfully. This is the way that we can purify, kind of a puritanical word, but to uh, hmm, gain wisdom and freedom from these painful states. Yeah, so it may be worthwhile to take some time to reflect on and to highlight and to notice kind of through your week where comparing is happening and how, how it steals our, our joy and how it, um, it's actually a really painful, really painful state. So, um, one of the practices that I'll include tonight is a practice. This was from Jill Shepherd at a three month retreat, offered this way of practicing compassion, self compassion, that uh, I find really helpful. And she synthesized it into really helpful four words that. Um, I'll fill out as we go along. Um, aware, care, release, and peace. Aware, care, release, peace. So when we practice with the awareness aspect, um, and I'll say more as we go along, In uh, I'll guide this a little bit, that um, I am aware of this pain or I'm aware of this comparing mind. Um, and then with that, you really ask yourself, but am I really aware of it? Or am I just kind of giving lip service to being aware of it? Yeah, I'm aware of it. <laughs> or really allowing ourselves to be aware, to, to notice how often it comes up, to notice what which habit of mind it is, comparing as less than, as equal to, as not as, uh, uh, as better than, um, and aware of the effect of it. And then the next part is, um, I care about this pain. And then to also ask, is that true? Do we really, you know, are we saying we care about it in order to get rid of it? Or do we care about it um, like to really give kind attention to ourselves? Like, oh, this is hard. I can see the roots of this. And sometimes when something's really, really painful, um, we might need to just mm, what's called titrating it just uh, a little bit, just for a few moments touch into caring about this painful state. And then you can move back to another object, like just feeling your hands or a breath. Uh, the third aspect is may this pain release, aware, care, release. So then we cultivate this compassionate, phrase for ourselves, may this pain release, may this ease, or may this 
let go it um may i find freedom from this um and then the last one is peace may i know peace and in this one uh there's a conscious remembering visualizing invoking imagining intention to feel that potential to feel and cultivate the remembering of peace so that's a kind of a synopsis of the practice that we'll do in relation to comparing mind okay so let's get ready for practice now uh, adjust your posture or your lighting uh, get anything else you need to be comfortable with these uh, heart practices from a heart practice we really want to start with as much uh, care and comfort with our being as we can i'm just going to adjust here for the noise. Mm, so just take whatever time you need to land into your posture, if you need any movements or sighing breaths. And just beginning with some time to just land into your posture. Notice if there's any striving or over efforting in posture, which could be an aspect of comparing mind. That we think this is how we should be. And just really take care and feel into what your body needs right now. Taking some time just to feel into any areas of habit tension. If you're not familiar with where those are for you, you might check out the space between the eyes, center of the forehead can often be contracted with a lot of thinking. The jaw or tongue maybe contracted with unspoken words. The throat could be contracted with unshed tears. The shoulders might be lifted with protection. The heart center might be solidified with protection or the belly. Check out the fingers and hands. Mm -hmm. 
uh, fin find their subtle contraction in the buttocks or thighs when there's a mm, an unconscious feeling of wanting to be elsewhere or to get up and go or do something else. So we check into some of these habit places and soften or widen or just give caring attention there and notice any change. Then we may feel a little bit softer or heavier, more grounded, present. And then we'll allow ourselves just to have a little bit of recollection or inquiry. If there's a tendency of comparing, feeling better than or superior to. This can show up in many, many areas of our lives. And it may be difficult to recognize or admit, so just, just be open and gentle. And it may show up for us as comparing that I am worse than or inferior to. And comparing can also show up as I am equal to. And then feeling into the understanding, the acknowledgement that comparison is the thief or the death of joy. And wishing for the ending of that, the release from these painful states. We'll practice with this four-part beautiful self-compassion meditation from Jill Shepherd. I am aware of this pain. The pain of comparison and judgment of self and others. Just check it out. Is that true? 
Am I really allowing myself to be aware? Aware of how it steals satisfaction, creates separation. I am aware of this pain and I care about this pain. Let me bring this gentle, caring compassion to this difficult state of heart and mind. as you would for a dear friend or to a child. And I care about it, not just to try to get rid of it, but to a really genuine feeling of the the difficulty of it and being full of care, cultivating care. Let's practice that together in this next few moments of silence. I care about this pain. And then we cultivate this heart's intention. May this pain release, this pain of comparing, pain of judging, pain of separation and inadequacy. May this pain release. Or may this pain ease. May I know freedom from this suffering. And see if you can really feel into that deep heart's wish for freedom.
And then, may I know peace. And here we really bring in some, whatever works for you, maybe visualizing, imagining, remembering. So we could recall times of joy when there's been freedom from comparing. Any kind of joy. To recollect that, recall the feeling of it. Remember that feeling of enoughness. Interconnection. Consciously cultivating, remembering peace or joy. And see that these were times free of comparison. What does contentment feel like in the body? And in these next five minutes of practice together in silence, you might like to guide yourself back through this series or just rest in that place of peace to whatever degree you're able to feel it. If something still feels sticky for you, you might begin again. I am aware of this pain. I care about this pain. May this pain release and may I know peace. Aware, care, release, peace.
Mm. So I hope there's something helpful in in these reflections and practice and uh, I'll put the links to the references down below if you've joined us on YouTube. Thanks for being here.